ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, our friend, Mr. Jared Spool. Thank you. Are you all set? Yes. Greetings and salutations, people who make delight. Uh, let's make some noise if you're having fun here today. Uh, excellent. Excellent. 2009, June 28th. Stephen Hawking throws a reception for time travelers. The way he ensures the guest list is he doesn't post the in invitation for another few weeks. You have to think about that one. <laughs> the week before, the CEO of Hyatt, in a similar act of science and imagination, decides to deal with his uh, big problem of rapidly decreasing customer satisfaction ratings by putting together a program where he's empowering his team, his, his, uh, uh, all the employees of Hyatt, to every so often randomly just gift something to a guest of the hotel. Give them a free bar tab or a massage at the spa or a room upgrade, just at random for no particular reason. They call this random acts of generosity. And it was an interesting strategy, this idea of, of delighting customers, putting into play what we call delighters, these things that, that for a hotel guest would in fact make them happy. But the problem at the time, and the reason that their customer satisfaction ratings were going down, was that they had a lot of frustrators to combat. Sometimes things in the rooms just didn't work, and, and the, ho the hotel wasn't functioning. And they were getting a large number of complaints across all their properties because of quality issues, because of reliability issues, because they just weren't able to make the hotels work. And instead of addressing those problems, they decided to go for delight and focus on delighting people. Hopefully, you can use delight to cover up the bad smell of the failing hotel. But this strategy didn't work. That's not the interesting part. The interesting part is we can predict why it doesn't work. We know why that is. Now, it turns out, I learned today, that uh, I get paid more if I put a customer journey map in my talk, so I've done that. <laughs> and for the hotel, the customer journey map is sort of a standard one, right? If we want to just sort of hone in on the online booking process, we can, we can look at how that process goes. And we can measure on a scale of frustration to delight what that experience is like for someone who's booking a hotel. And we can then map out the parts that are delightful and the parts that are not so delightful. And we can see that, that some parts work really well and some parts are really frustrating, like when you have to put in the credit card information multiple times because it keeps telling you about one error message at a time, even though you'd made uh, multiple mistakes because you didn't understand what it was asking. And what you end up with is this map that uh, gives you a picture of what that customer's like. And this is probably the single most useful uh, diagramming tool that we can have when we want to start thinking about delight. And what it tells us, in fact, is that, is that there's a strata here. Everything that appears down at the bottom is really a frustrating experience. And everything that appears at the top is really a delightful experience. But the question is, what comes in the middle? What is it that happens there? What's that called? Now, when we go to a restaurant and we get our meal, we want that meal to be delicious, right? We're not hoping that that meal will be just edible. Now he says, you know, I, ate, I went to this place. There's a food truck. We just went to it. There's a food truck down there. It's got the most edible stuff you've ever had. <laughs> nobody says that. You know why nobody says that? Because it's not a very high bar. Edible is the same 
as satisfactory. When we're asking, is this experience satisfactory, that's what we're asking, right? Here's a satisfaction survey put out by my good friends at United. <laughs> and they were intrigued by my use of social media. So they asked me how satisfied I was with the social media representative that handled my request. I believe my request was, get your damn airlines to work right. <laughs> and so they rated this on a scale of extremely satisfied to extremely dissatisfied. What the hell is extremely satisfied? Right? What does that mean? Is that like extremely delicious? Or is it like extremely edible? Right? What, is that, what is that meaning? The second question on the survey was also awesome. Would you use or recommend social media in the future for support and service? Yes, but not yours. <laughs> so that box in the middle, what is it? Well, in my world, in online experiences, we think of it as being usable. Usable is that sort of satisfactory level. If we're usable, we're satisfactory. And this turns out to be really important historically because when I started in this business back 30 years ago, we were on a mission to make the world more usable. We wanted everything to be more usable because everything back then was really frustrating. And to get from frustrating to usable, it's actually quite simple. We know how to do this. Just don't suck anymore. <laughs> right? But it turns out the skills required to get from frustrating to usable are not the same skills as required to get from usable to delightful. They're different. To be delightful requires other talents, other skills, other techniques. And so those of us who worked for years trying to just get things usable, we were ill-equipped when we actually got there. When we had pretty much sanded all the frustrating bits out of the process, and now we were in this era of, of thinking about things from a delightful stance. And it took us a long time to realize that not being sucky was not the same as being delightful. And we were stuck because we'd gotten all the frustration removed, but we didn't know how to get the delight added in. One is a removal process, and one is an addition process. And that's key. So we have to think about how we translate this into strategy. What is the strategy that we're going to use? Now, one way to imagine what UX strategy really is, is that it's in its essence, it's getting people to go from frustrated to delight. To actually be able to say, all of our customers are delighted. All of our users are delighted. All of our employees are delighted. Whoever we're building these systems for, they are all delighted by what we have done. And we know how to do this. There's a series of questions that we can start to ask to, to get us there. We can you know, figure out what it's going to be and, and how to allocate the resources behind it and what we're going to actually say no to because keeping stuff out is, is absolutely critical and telling that we've done a good job and making sure that we're different from others in our marketplace and understanding what that innovation question is, is going to be about and the all-important question, figuring out how we're going to price it. Right? All of these things are part of that strategy. If we can answer all these questions, we are well on the way to the strategy that's going to get us there. So that's the thing. Here we are, trying to figure out what it was about Hyatt that was just not going to work. And the dude who had figured it out had actually figured it out two decades before. His name is Noriaki Kano, an economist. And he wanted to address the question of what type of investment does it take 
to make customers satisfied, to make customers delighted. What kind of, what kind of investment do you need? Very economist type question. And so he built this little model, which we all now refer to as the Kano model. I don't think he did, I think he just said this is my model. I don't know, I never talked to him about it. But this model has two axes, like most good economist models. Uh, one is user, user satisfaction, goes from extreme frustration to extreme delight. And the other one is investment, going from virtually no investment to a ton of investment. Simple model. And then he started to collect data and see where things laid out on the model. And he quickly found out that there were basically three patterns of how the data would fall onto the model. The first one is called the performance payoff. And the performance payoff is that straight sort of we keep adding features to what we're doing and eventually people are going to be delighted because this thing does everything that we want it to do. Right? This is sort of the traditional way that product management has approached building products, creating requirements, going about it. But he found two other curves that were really interesting. One was down in the bottom right, and it's called the basic expectation curve. And it's really about the expectations that we have. If you've stayed in a hotel recently, I'm going to bet that when you came into your hotel room, somewhere probably near the front door, there was another door. And behind that door were some amazing features. A sink, a shower, a toilet. These are awesome. <laughs> and realistically, you probably didn't get very excited about it. But the fact is, is that in the world of staying in other people's places, if you look at the entire history of people staying in, in hotels and inns, having a bathroom in your own room, it's a pretty new feature. It's only been around for a couple of decades. Right? Your grandparents may have stayed in hotels that didn't have bathrooms in the, the hotel room. Their grandparents, most likely, if they stayed anywhere, did not. When Joseph and Mary checked into the inn, there was no bathroom in the room. Here we have it. We have bathrooms now. And if we go to a hotel and the bathroom doesn't work, if the shower doesn't deliver hot water, if the toilet overflows, we get upset. Yet I'm going to bet that nowhere on the hotel website does it say anywhere that you will have hot water in your shower when you start. They don't mention it. It probably was never discussed amongst the marketing team. That's what a basic expectation is. On the other end of the curve, we have uh, ex excitement generators. And excitement generators are things that delight us. They don't take a whole lot of investment, but they, they end up delighting us. So, that's what the Hyatt was going for with that, you know, sort of free room thing was, was could we come up with a, uh, an excitement generator that would get people going? Wi-Fi in the room, right? Excitement. That's great. I got Wi-Fi in my hotel room. It's awesome. So, so these, are, these are these things. And we can sort of take them apart and look at them individually. So let's, let's do that. And let's start with that performance payoff. Because that's the one that's most routine. And the performance payoff is about features. Lots of features. When Mountain Lion came out, Apple proudly announced that it had more than 200 features. I'm sure when Mavericks, the next release, comes out, it will have another multiple of 100 features to go with it. Every time. More features, more features, more features. That's how we do it. And there's a cycle to this. And I see this cycle amongst our clients over and over and over again. Release one of 
the, uh, 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 of the product comes out, usually by some startup, some, and it has just a couple of features, just, just a handful of them. Everybody loves it. Takes off. It's exciting. People are, are, are thrilled with this. Second release comes, or 1.5, add a couple more features, people are even more excited. Great. This is great. We're going great. OK. Need people to upgrade. We're going we're gonna to add a few more features here. And then we're going to come out with another release and add a few more features here. And we're just going to keep doing this each time we're trying to get more stuff into the product. We need to attract new customers. We need to attract existing customers. We got to get that upgrade dollar. So we're going to keep adding more and more features to every release. And pretty soon, we've got all these features in the product. And nobody can get anything done with it. It is too complicated. It is too confusing. And worse, the code is a disaster because we've been jury rigging this stuff in one at a time, and everything is miserable. Nobody will touch the billing engine. That thing breaks when you go anywhere near it. So we've got all this wrapper around the billing engine. Oh, yeah, you've got the billing engine, don't you? I can tell, right? It's like, oh my God, he's talking about us. And, and, so all of a sudden, we've got this, this disaster. This is what we call experience rot. Experience rot happens when we increase features because suddenly we're also increasing complexity and decreasing the user experience. That's experience rot. Happens every time. See it all the time. So here we are, the world of too many features. Now. This is when they come to us and they say, hey, we need you to help. So we say, okay, we're going to go meet some customers. Let's go out. We meet some customers. And what do we discover? We discover that most of these features aren't being used. Only a handful of the features are actually being used by anybody. The rest of them are sitting there dormant, or there's just one or two sites that are using it, but not very well. And all those other features are just, just code that's, that's eating up space that's causing us stress. So here's what the smart companies do. The smart companies cut out the rest of that stuff. And they make a new release that just has those small features. And this turns out to be how you deal with experience rot. You cut out all the bad stuff out, and you go back to the basics. Now, here's the deal. Every time I show this to executives, they go, well, yeah, I mean, that must work for other companies, but that would never work for us. Our customers would never put up with it. We, you know, we're way too down this road. Our sales force would never do it. We've got customers who need that thing we're cutting out. There's no way we're getting rid of all these features. And I say, that's fine. I don't care. Because <laughs> it's going to happen. They go, no, 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 you don't understand. It's not going to happen. I say, oh, no, it's going to happen. It just isn't going to be you. <laughs> Right? It's going to be somebody else. And, and this is it, right? So this is how you deal with it. This is uh, uh, from uh, Jason Fried of 37 Signals in their book, Getting Real. He writes that, that you have to start the product cycle by saying no. No is the most important product tool we have. If we really want to create delightful interfaces, we start creating delightful interfaces by saying no to most of the things that people want. And that's completely counterintuitive to the design process, but that is, in fact, how it has to be done, because that's the only way that we can deal with the performance payoff issues. We focus on just those things that actually pay off, and we make sure that we understand exactly why every feature is there, because we know coming down the road is that experience rot. But that's not our only issue. We also have to deal with this basic expectation thing. And this basic expectation thing, it's gnarly. Right? That hotel bathroom, it has a shower. And we expect that shower to have hot water. Not only do we expect it to have hot water, we have expect it to have hot water instantly. The other day, I was staying on the 32nd floor of a hotel. And I expected that as soon as I turned on the hot water, it was going to be hot. Where the hell did that expectation come from? <laughs> At home, I live in a one-story house. I turn on the damn water, and it takes four minutes for it to get hot. <laughs> damn landlord. The fact is, is that we have this expectation. It just came out of nowhere. We want hot water. And do you know what hotels have to go through to make that work? 
How do you make a skyscraper always have hot water? Well, you don't have a hot water heater in the basement. What you have are circulators and hot water heaters on almost every floor. And so it's constantly circulating hot water all the way through the system, always. So that no matter where you are in the building, you are never more than a couple of meters away from really hot water running through the pipes. The expense of making sure you have that instant hot water is huge. Basic expectations are really expensive to meet. Netflix found this out. They had this DVD model, and then they went to this streaming model, and they thought, well, people are going to like streaming better, so we're going we're to be able to deal with this. But the problem was, what, was nobody paid attention to them when they got into the DVD business, so they were able to get all these deals negotiated with all the, with all the studios really easily. But now they were the top dog, and, and at the streaming thing, the, the, the studios were sort of holding out. They weren't negotiating. So suddenly you've got this weird sort of dichotomy where some movies you can instantly watch on streaming, and other movies you can't, and there's no explanation for it. You can't figure it out. Everybody's got this basic expectation that every movie they want to watch is going to be streamable. But for some reason, it's not. And there's no algorithm that will help predict this, and, and it really creates this thing. So suddenly we have these, these, these evenings where the evening is figuring out what movie we can watch on Netflix. <laughs> Honey, would you like to sit down and spend two hours figuring out what movie we should watch? And, and that's the problem with basic expectations. There's a little village in Ireland called Airfield. But the weird thing about Airfield, Ireland, is it does not have an airfield. But Apple Maps, for some reason, thought it did. <laughs> and this really upset the Irish government because they were afraid that some pilot who was completely lost, who'd lost all their systems, would open up their damn phone and look up and say, oh, there's an airfield. Let's land there, and they're going to end up in the, in the town hall. You've been there? No, but Apple Maps has been directing people onto the runway at Fairbanks International. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, I could believe that. And this is the, the uh, problem with, with maps, right? Maps, the issue with maps was not really a technical issue. It was a basic expectations issue. We expected maps to just work out of the box. Here's the funny thing. When Google Maps first showed up, it was just as crappy as Apple Maps. But now Apple Maps has become a whole new level of art where we can see <laughs> a new perspective on the world that really, this one's my favorite, the Burger King in the old church. <laughs> it's a, I think Burger King is, actually means church in, in Danish. Um, is Burger Kingish vegan? Uh, this, is, this is the thing about basic expectations, right? And here's the deal. Notice that the curve does not go above that neutral line. It does not go above that center line. It's because you can never meet, you can never exceed, you can never delight people by meeting expectations. It's like, no one comes running out of their hotel room going, oh my gosh, that was like the best hot shower ever, right? That, that toilet flushed perfectly first time, didn't have to flush it a second time. Love it. <laughs> right? Nobody ever says that. The best you can do is satisfy, but you can screw it up. You can, you can completely screw up it. All you have to do is, is make it worse. And that's what happened to Apple. That's what happened to Netflix. These stalwarts of great design suddenly found themselves dealing with basic expectations. So what we want to do is make sure that we're constantly being diligent, looking for what those expectations are. Saw this recently with a client that has a, a product that users love, and they came out with their 
iPad version, but the iPad version only did a subset of the functionality because, well, it was new and they were just getting it out there. But they made a big deal and they marketed to everybody that this iPad version was out there and people downloaded it and then they went to do the thing they normally do every day and they couldn't do it because that function hadn't been added. That basic expectation hadn't been met. So if you go to the reviews for this app, every review is like a one-star review of all these people saying, but I couldn't do my basic functions. And I said to the CEO, they're working on version two, but it still won't have all the stuff. I said, what you should do is go through, actually figure out who's using the functionality. And uh, uh, if they're using a function on a regular basis that's not in the app, do not market the app to them. Or at least send them a note that says, don't download it. Wait, we're working on that stuff, but you're not going to be happy with this because it doesn't do the thing that we know you do every day. Just wait. It'll be there. We're working on it. He said, well, we don't want to highlight what we don't do. I said, oh, you will. <laughs> you can either do it before launch or after launch. You get a choice. But you will be highlighting what you don't do. That's what basic expectations is. And then there's the excitement generators. So we have our customer journey map. And Leslie mentioned this morning that one of the things we can do with the customer journey map is we can think about, well, what would it mean if the whole thing were delightful? Could we imagine an experience that does the same things but delightful all the way across? Right? Make it all delightful across the, the experience. And that's really what the excitement generators are about. They are about making it delightful all the way across. And it turns out that we can break this down a little further. Taking what Kano started with and adding what Dana Chisnell did with her three approaches to delight, we can actually break this up into pleasure, flow, and meaning. And we can look at each of those things independently. Let's look at pleasure. So these dudes at a university decided to uh, 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 try a little experiment. And they went to eBay and they bought these little trinkets. Uh, just little knickknacks that they bought, random things they found. This one cost three bucks. And then they hired a writer, a, a, a storyteller. And they had them write a story about the trinket. And then they took the story and made that the product description of the product and resold it on eBay. This one sold for 193 bucks. <laughs> Completely fictional story. It's brilliant. It's all about how you know, the house burned down and this was the only thing left and mother came, kept it as a good luck charm and escaped the Nazis with it and you know. <laughs> and that's worth 190 bucks. <laughs> Stories delight. They bring pleasure. And it's not just, you know, fictional stories about saving the lives from the Nazis, right? It, it can just be a good product description. We brought people in. We, we do these, these things. They're called compelled shopping analyses. And what we do is we, we bring people in who are, who are shopping for products. And, and we actually, the, the participants we recruit are actually in the process of shopping. So in this case, we found people who are shopping for cameras and uh, uh, who are planning to buy one in the next few months. And we actually bring them in. And, and with our corporate sponsor's money, we actually give it to them to pay to buy the camera. So, so if they find the camera they want during our study, they can actually use the money we give them to buy the camera. And so we give them the money for that. And um, uh, we brought them to, to Walmart, and we, we looked at the uh, Walmart product description with them. And it's, it's, the Walmart product descriptions are all taken directly from the manufacturer. So they just pump the manufacturer copy right into the thing. Uh, but we also looked at another company called Crutchfield. And we had people shop for cameras here. 
Crutchfield has a ton more information. It just sort of keeps going and going and going, and they offer all these sort of accessories and all these pieces to it. And it was really stunning. And when we looked at what people spent on the, on the websites, uh, we, we gave everybody a budget. That was how they figured out. So that was the money we were going to give them, and, and they had it. And, and on Walmart, people spent on average about 89% of their, uh, their budget, which was not unusual. Most of the, of the 13 or so sites that we studied in this particular study, the average was about $90, $91. So this was not far off the mark for that. But there was this outlier, which was Crutchfield. They came in at 237%. That means that not only did they spend all the money we gave them, but they added another $137 for each $100 we gave them on the camera. And that was really incredible. They spent way more money. And the only difference, it's the same product, the only difference was the stories that they told. And when we talked to them about it, they just enjoyed shopping at Crutchfield more. Because the, that content is all written by people at Crutchfield. It's written by camera enthusiasts who work at Crutchfield, who actually write the content and talk about what they do with it and what they love about the camera and all these things. And it goes on for pages, and it works. And that's pleasurable. That's delightful. We can now move over to flow. And the best way to talk about flow is to show you flow. This is the progressive website, and, and flow is their spokesperson. But that's actually not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is how you get a quote. Because before progressive came along, the Quote process took about 20 minutes. You had to answer about 80 questions. And chances are, for 70% of the people who tried to get an online quote, the answer would be, sorry, we don't sell insurance in your neighborhood. And the progressive people turn that upside down. The first thing they ask you is your zip code. If it turns out that your zip code is not someplace they sell, they disqualify you right off the bat. Nobody else did this before. I, I don't know why not. They just didn't. It's not how they worked. But the, uh, 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 actually, I do know why they didn't do it. The, the reason they didn't do it was because it took an extra hit to the server. Right? In order to check the zip code, you had to ask the server just about the zip code. And every, every time you hit the, the server, it cost them money. So they'd rather just do the whole quote at once. So they'll get all the information and then tell you you live in the wrong zip code. And that's why they did it. But here it's a little different. So once you get there, they start to fill out this form. And interestingly enough, they already put the zip code in, because you've already put it in, so you don't have to do that twice. You put in your name, your mailing address, your birth date. And then they do something really neat. They go look up and see what cars you own and actually show you pictures of the cars that are in the registry or in the Department of Motor Vehicles database and say, are these the ones you want to insure? And then from there, because they know which model a car, they already know all that information about what equipment it has and what, it, what safety stuff it has, so they don't have to ask you that. So they just get another bare minimum stuff, and they got the whole thing down to six screens. And at the end of the six screens, you get a quote. Whole thing is under three minutes. So they went from 20 minutes to three minutes, took over the industry. This is delightful because it's, it, it makes the flow work. Right? You just get there, you follow the process, and you're done. That's what makes it delightful. It's not particularly pleasurable in, in a way that any website about insurance is pleasurable, but it's definitely delightful because it just is so much easier than all the other ways to do it. The last category that Dana came up with is this category of meaning. And for meaning, the easiest way to explain this is to turn to the folks at Zipcar. On November 6, 2012, Election Day, they were giving out half-price Zipcars for anybody who would drive people to the polls. Brilliant marketing campaign. And Zipcar does stuff like this all the time. There are always sort of taking their goodwill with their customers and, and uh, uh, giving free cars to deliver food on Thanksgiving to, to people in need and uh, uh, all sorts of programs like that that are just really about more than just renting a car when you need it. And 
Not everybody resonates with this, but a lot of people find their relationship with Zipcar to be one of meaning, one that really is like we're in it together and, and they're using their resources and I'm going to help them use their resources to do good in the world and then I, I'm bonding with that brand. And suddenly we're now doing all this. The thing is, is that this is authentic. It's easy to make it not authentic. During the Olympics, United was running this massive campaign about how they were transporting all of the Olympic teams to, uh, uh, to, to the, the London to be able to get there. And yes, they were transporting all these people. There's no doubt about that. But it did not translate for United customers because United customers did not see that same care that they were giving the Olympic teams in those commercials given to them at any time they travel. If you want to try and find meaning in anything that United does, the basic message they send is, damn it, this would be a lot easier if you weren't here. <laughs> it would be so much easier to fly these planes if you did not have to get on it. <laughs> and so there, there's no meaning there. So if you're going to do the meaning thing, you have to be completely 100% authentic, which means it has to go down to the core of your business. And most people can't pull this off. But this is it, right? This is this idea of pleasure flow meaning that actually get us there. And we can put the puzzle back together and see the whole Kano model in its full form. But there's one more thing about it that I haven't told you. And that is that these excitement generators, over time, they just become basic expectations. It used to be that when you got to the hotel room, it was really exciting that they had Wi-Fi. Now, if you go to a hotel room and they don't have Wi-Fi, you're pissed. What do you mean you don't have Wi-Fi? I mean I have to go to the lobby to get Wi-Fi. What do you mean I have to pay $30 a night for Wi-Fi in your hotel? That's ridiculous. I pay $40 for an entire month at home. I'm just going to have Comcast show up before I get here next time <laughs> and install the damn thing. Two nights I've paid for a month. You can thank me. Room 413 has Comcast Wi-Fi. <laughs> Those things that are exciting today will be basic expectations later. And, and you know what? We may not make it that. Somebody else may make it that for us. Once the competitors get wind that this is good for people, everybody's going to want to do it. And all of a sudden, we've, we've pushed it into the corner. So those excitement generators are the hardest piece of this to do well. And we can do the pleasure thing. That's just being cute and clever with our copy and, and going off and, and just making sure we, we've, we've done the right pieces of it. But that meaning part, that's the most difficult. And that's really where we, we, we have to work hard. So it turns out these lines have names. The current experience is what users are currently doing. That line across the top of what happens if we make the whole thing delightful, we call that the aspirational experience. And the distance between current experience and aspirational experience, well, that's, that also has a name. Call it. Uh, Innovation. Innovation is how we get that line up. It's how we move forward. And innovation comes in interesting forms.
Leah talked this morning about her work in Intuit, and Intuit's been doing some really interesting things. This is a, a, a product of Intuit that came out a couple years ago. It sucks the ink right off the form. <laughs> no, it's called SnapTax. And, and, and what it does is it basically takes uh, 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 the, the W-2 form that you bring home from your employer, and it takes a picture of it. It reads the text off the picture. It fills out a 1040 EZ form. And after you've taken all your W-2s, because there's a good chance you've got multiple of them. You, uh, 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 you, it will then compile all that data. It even has your name and address on it. There's absolutely nothing you have to put in other than to say, yes, I believe this to be accurate. And then it submits it automatically for you. So all that effort of doing your taxes for the 65% of Americans who fill out 1040 EZs every year, it does all the calculations, figures out the EIC credit and all the other pieces of it, and it does it. And it's really quite simple in how it works. It, 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 it takes a picture, it OCRs it, it then fills out the form, and then it submits it. And what's interesting about this is that that's innovation. Combining all that was innovative. Now, innovation is a word that is used all the time. <laughs> but here's the problem with the word innovation. I don't think that word means what you think it means. It turns out that innovation is not about inventions. Intuit did not invent taking pictures. They did not invent OCRing financial forms. They did not invent filing electronically. They did not invent filling out the form automatically. They did not invent any of those things. What they did was they combined those things in a way that added value in a place where there was no value before. That is innovation. And so when you get the directive from management to be innovative, it's quite simple to do, right? Figure out what that current experience is. Figure out what that aspirational experience might be. And then figure out what the baby steps are that are going to get you from your current experience to that aspirational experience, just like we've been talking about all morning. And by taking those baby steps, you'll be able to add value where it wasn't before, and you'll end up delighting your customers. And so what we want to take away here is that experience rot is coming to get us if it hasn't gotten us already. We need to constantly be diligent to pruning away those features and ensuring that we're not doing that, not going down that road, because that's the number one thing that prevents us from doing anything innovative, anything delightful, is that damn experience rot. It's what gives our competitors all their advantage. And what we need to make sure we do is we go and we are constantly studying basic expectations. Do we understand what expectations we're missing with every new thing we do? Then we can start to apply things like pleasure, flow, and meaning in order to create great delight. But we have to keep in mind that those delighters that we come up with are going to eventually become basic expectations, so we have to constantly be looking for new ones and taking those baby steps to get there. And that's what I came to talk to you about. If by chance you found this interesting, it turns out that I've partnered up with a fabulous woman named Dr. J Leslie Jensen Inman, and the two of us are actually in the process of figuring out how to train large numbers of designers to be able to do just what I talked about. And it's a program that we're calling the Unicorn Institute. 
and it's to create designers who are generalists who can go out and work with companies uh, inside the companies uh, and, and be these, these, these armies of folks. And you, if you're interested in design education and what's happening for vocational education design uh, and particularly how it can help your company, check out unicorninstitute.com, a URL I might add that I was very pleased that was available. And uh, also, if for some reason you found anything I had to say interesting. I've written a ton of this stuff on UIE.com. Uh, my email is jspool at UIE.com. And please, by all means, feel free to connect up with me on LinkedIn. If you work in UX, I definitely want to meet you and talk to you there. And finally, you can follow me on the Twitters, where I talk about design, design education, things like the Kano model, and my newest insights into the amazing job that United is doing in their customer service entries. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for encouraging my behavior.